I'm glad Peter didn't talk very much about the reports because I'm going to do that a little bit. Um, obviously, from an outsider's perspective, unlike the other people on this panel, I was not involved in any of those um, uh, reports. Um, and I also want to talk from the perspective of uh, the everyday academic at what Eddie Webster calls the chalk face. Um, I want to look at these proposals and think about how that would shape the work that, that I do um, in social sciences, not in the humanities. I think there's a slightly, uh, the, the fudging of the, the language uh, is important to note. Um, when, when we talk about humanities, we include social sciences. I don't think all of the problems that are faced by the classical humanities disciplines are faced in the social sciences for a range of reasons which uh, we can talk about. But I think that when we, uh, when we talk about um, humanities and we uh, invoke examples from social sciences, we're making a fundamental mistake. I think we need, and I'm, I'm slightly sorry that it is social scientists um, on, the, on the panel and not somebody from, say, uh, literature or African languages, because I think we might have had a slightly different conversation. But having, having said that, uh, let me begin with my presentation and to start by saying that in my view the crisis of the humanities um, is, uh, is a, a microcosm of the crisis of the idea of the university, not just in our country but across the world. And Professor Setati pointed to some of the global uh, problems with uh, the way in which uh, universities are being treated as training, as the training ground for um, to meet the needs of the new economy began, of course, uh, in, in its sharpest sense by Margaret Thatcher in the UK, uh, continued by the Labour government of Tony Blair, uh, a, a massive restructuring which then filtered uh, across the world, um, particularly in the former colonies. We ourselves uh, borrowed uh, several generations later from the way in which the Australians went about restructuring uh, universities. My own training was in North America, and uh, you know, once I left South Africa, I, did, I worked at uh, Tull, I studied at UDW and Natal, and then went to Canada. And the North American system is very different, and I'll come back to that uh, a little later. But I think that the idea of the university is under threat as the space in our society in which we uh, we nurture critical thinking, critical skills, and a broad awareness um, of the world around us and what shapes the world around us. I think that the, 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 re the recession, the rise of a kind of uh, uh, understanding of the university as the ground for training rather than education um, has resulted in a kind of... Um, I would say not just a devaluing of the humanities, but a dissing of the humanities as the kind of privileged space that is anachronistic in, uh, in this uh, late capitalist world. That the, uh, the university, uh, Peter, you spoke about nostalgia. It's not just a nostalgia for humanities. It's a nostalgia for that university system that we think can no longer matter. Um, and yet, of course, this goes along in our country with the huge move towards rebuilding and creating an identity for South Africa um, in a new society with a recognition of the diversity of histories about which we know very little, about which uh, we have to look to the humanities to learn, uh, to learn from. So it seems to me there's this tension between uh, the global understanding of a marketized university that is serving the needs of a dynamic knowledge-based economy um, in which um, there is no longer the time or the space to do the careful thinking and the careful reading, which of course is how we thought of a university. When I went to university, you read for a degree. We don't read for a degree anymore. We, uh, we test for a degree. And that strikes me as being at the heart of the current uh, crisis. In the South African um, 
restructuring of university education. We, we are also dealing with a massive expansion of universities since 1994. Uh, the legacy uh, effects of apartheid and the redistribution of resources across universities. Um, I think we went through a period in which the university um, was both uh, uh, treated as uh, absolutely significant and at the same time treated as very privileged. So those universities that represented privilege, mine being one of them, um, were for a range of political reasons uh, not uh, given the same kind of hearing in policy debates because they seem to represent the voice of privilege. Um, and instead we have a uh, policy framework that uh, is incoherent, that continues to be based in some old Oxbridge model in our actual workings, uh, in the way in which, and I'll come back to that, the way in which our degrees are structured, in the way in which we think about postgraduate education. We haven't grappled with massification and we haven't looked to how a country like the United States uh, dealt with massification, dealt with the rising number of um, working class students entering the university, how that restructuring took place. So we have, we have these two reports before us which have opened up such uh, a wonderful debate and I want to thank the two colleagues who are here who did so much of the work on it. Uh, as, as Peter uh, Vail pointed out, there are many similarities between these two reports. Both of them identify the problem in relatively similar ways. Um, the, the ASAF report and the D, uh, Department of Higher Education and Training Charter both uh, look at issues like declining uh, enrollments, declining funding going to the universities. Um, they look at uh, postgraduate education as a particular area of concern. Um, I was uh, interested in the ASAF report, I think particularly because it, it uh, chimed very well with the experiences that we have at uh, Wits University of the scientization of the humanities, the introduction of a range of measures uh, out of, of excellence and quality out of the science model um, that have had a massive impact on the way in which subsidization takes place uh, for humanities research. The, the one, uh, well, there are many of them, and I know that you'll be familiar with this. But for example, um, I will give you two examples. Uh, the, the science model of a PhD in which um, the supervisor uh, publishes with their students is one that is anathema in the humanities. In the humanities, what we see ourselves doing uh, is, is nurturing critical independent thinking. It is, it is considered a form of plagiarism for a supervisor to put their name to a student's work because that just of a PhD student, right? Because, that, uh, it, because the model of the work is different to a model of a very top-down uh, science project in which a whole team is working together around one problem. Um, the idea of the PhD in humanities is of an individual demonstrating their ability, uh, uh, their mastery of a, of a field, their ability to uh, problem solve, uh, and their ability to write uh, and, and shape the theoretical debate. So when we are told uh, in humanities that our publications output is problematic, we are being measured against criteria that we cannot fulfill and I think do not want to fulfill, and should we choose to fulfill it, I think we will be moving away from what we consider in humanities to be uh, a critical mind, the development of a critical mind. So that's one example of the scientization model that I think uh, is problematic. A second example of the, the model is, is the um, undue emphasis given to publishing in uh, international journals and to be using measures of international journals. And again, I can just, if I could use an example um, from uh, political studies, I have a colleague who is a, um, an absolutely phenomenal theoretical uh, mind, has uh, writes in the field of democracy, 
okay? Uh, and rights in the field of democracy uh, by engaging the, the, the contemporary um, challenges in South Africa. If that person were to apply for an NRF rating, uh, he would not get an A rating. There is no chance at all that his absolutely path-breaking work that has nurtured critical minds over generations, that has published in a range of different uh, fora will, will be valued. And why won't he? Because he, he will be competing against the greatest minds located at Oxford who write on democracy. He would have to compete with a David Held uh, who, or, or an Amartya Sen, who is in, uh, working in a completely uh, different set of uh, conditions. So what is this, the criteria by which we would want to rate somebody in a university in South Africa? Or is that a fair, uh, you know, we can give, we can, uh, we can say we want, of course we want to engage with global debates, of course we want to be relevant to intellectual debates around the world, we are not a parochial society, but if we use that kind of a measure for rating, I think we undermine the kind of work that is being done in the humanities and we set up targets that, by which we are, we are in fact doomed to fail. So scientism, scientization uh, of humanity strikes me as uh, a particularly strong um, and a more difficult issue to deal with uh, in uh, identifying problems. Um, instrumentalism, the increasing um, turn to uh, the kind of training that is of use in the market. I think we, several people have, have pointed that out. It's called marketization in the Department of Higher Education uh, and Training Charter. Uh, the number of uh, PhDs and the quality of the PhDs that we are able to produce is an, an issue of uh, uh, significance. Um, the, the, the charter raises the question of plagiarism, which I think, of course, we all we all know is a big problem. Uh, and then research productivity, by which I think there's an understanding, again, uh, that productivity is measured by the number of uh, articles in particular journals. I personally would never try to publish in the American Political Science Review because it is a behavioralist journal, yet it is number one in my discipline. Does that mean my work is not good? No. And, you know, so, so we need to think about those. Okay. There are many common elements. Peter Vale pointed to those. The shared concern about the way in which uh, the humanities are regarded by the government and in the, in the world out there. The, the, the Business Day story is a very good example of the, the way in which the public themselves have kind of accepted that it somehow, you know, a BA, well, it was there when we were students too, as a stood for bugger all, right? Um, there's an agreement on the need to review the funding models uh, in the cycle from teaching to research, and both see the need for some kind of institutional arrangement uh, to take us forward. Their recommendations are some, some similar, some different. Um, in, uh, let, me, let me just pick, out on, pick up on what is uh, particularly different, and that is the institutional architecture that is offered. Um, by these two reports. In the one report, a council for the humanities is suggested, something along the lines of the academy, uh, which at the moment doesn't really have a way to recognize the humanities. That would be a kind of a champion um, for the humanities that would uh, have a link possibly to, uh, to debates in, uh, in the policy world, um, that would be advocating uh, on behalf of humanities across the country uh, when funding priorities are, are set up. And in the case of the Charter, this extremely elaborate uh, architecture, which has uh, a national institute at the top, um, five schools spread across the country on different kinds of themes, seven different panels, subcommittees, fora, and then, uh, and then six what they call catalytic projects, which uh, perhaps I missed but are not defined what those catalytic projects will be. So two very different kinds of models. The ASAF report has been critiqued primarily by Johan Mouton from Stellenbosch, although 
There may be others that I couldn't find. And his, uh, you know, his critique, I suppose, in the first place, the evidence of the crisis of the humanities, he says, is overstated. He questions uh, issues of enrollments, statistics. Um, to me, these are not um, deal-breaking critiques, if you know what I mean. They don't, they're, not the, they're not the kind of critiques. And, and he says there's no clarity on what the council would do. I'm not going to treat those critiques terribly seriously because I don't think that even if those were to be corrected, those statistics, that they would necessarily um, change the, the underlying um, carefully researched arguments about uh, the, the way in which um, humanity struggles within the existing university system uh, to meet, uh, to meet uh, the demand to create, or not the demand, perhaps its own, its own stated goal of creating uh, critical minds. The charter, the crit charter, on the other hand, has uh, received a huge a uh, hugely larger set of critiques and a much more damning set of critiques. And for the purposes of discussion, I want to just lay these out so that we, we have a basis for um, our, um, our engagement. So here too, Bhutan is concerned with the fact that we have this very elaborate architecture that's not uh, spelled out. We don't know what it's going to do, who is going to lead it, where the funding is going to come from. Um, I think that that is a, f uh, a fair critique when you are putting out such a, such a big system that you don't have the detail in it that people can engage with. So, so there's no way of engaging with something on the table yet. Uh, Paula Ensor at UCT has argued that this will bureaucratize the humanities uh, even further, and bureaucratization has been one of the reasons why humanities um, at all, not just humanities, I would say right across the university, academics have, uh, have struggled to fulfill their core role because of the bureaucratization of our work. Um, Peter Vale himself and his colleagues have critiqued the, the charter for setting up potential conflicts between the institutes, the institute at the top, and all its structures and the universities over the same small pool of funds. Uh, does it mean that some uh, the resources directed to uh, the institute and its structures will ta be taken out of the same pool that universities uh, have to um, uh, compete for? Uh, will there be a duplication of functions? Um, uh, what, what will be the effect of um, advancing certain uh, catalytic projects over others. You, you can imagine that this is going, if you think about the kinds of uh, issues that came up in trying to address the D DST grand challenges funding uh, scenario, you, you see how this is going to uh, potentially lead to enormous conflict across the university sector. Um, there's critique that setting up an institute in this form will introduce regulation of humanities by setting up new kinds of criteria for funding. I want to speak a little bit about John Higgins' critique, which says that what we have uh, in the charter is uh, a model of applied nationalism. Uh, in other words, uh, that that the idea that the universities should be servicing the needs of uh, the nation and those needs then being defined by a small set of people associated with government uh, creates a kind of applied nationalism uh, that is no different to the market. A set of criteria that devalue, again, uh, the, the, the old notion of the university in which um, there is space for, uh, for critical thinking to take place, for problems to be defined rather than always be solved. Sometimes even the de definition of a problem uh, is a, a, um, a, an um, advance on theoretical debate. Um, but uh, the, the kind of move towards a problem-solving model that is in the service of nationalism, he argues, is simply a, a, a politicized marketization. So, so the, 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 those are the reports. And I, when I read those reports, I read it not 
from my role as the former assistant dean for research or my role in you know sitting on uh, in the WITS uh, council committee for research um, but I, I try to read it from the perspective of you and I every day uh, academics wanting to do our very best uh, and and build up our our departments our disciplines and the universities uh, in the country and serve our students uh, as uh, rather than a, a set of abstract criteria. So what I see from the chalk face in this crisis that I think has, has got uh, lost in the discussion on the funding model and the institutional architecture um, is that we see here uh, the consequences of the massification of higher education in South Africa without a corresponding change in the structuring of the university. So we have the conventional three-year degree. We have uh, um, very, uh, increasingly large classes. We have students in our universities now who did not uh, come through good uh, primary and secondary uh, education. I think, unlike Wits University in the past, I think when it was, when it was um, had white students in it, those students had the equivalent of private school education on public school funding. They were very well trained when they came into the university. They knew how to read. They knew how to write. Um, all systems that expand uh, their base, open up their doors, uh, to uh, in, in, in a way that breaks through the privilege of class face this problem that you're going to get students who are coming from uh, public education systems that are not very good, even in the United States, right? They all have this. Uh, but we have retained our British model um, of the three-year degree. We semesterized in most universities inadequately. Semesterization was meant to be a system that allowed flexibility so people could could uh, move in and out, but we lost, what we lost in that process was the relationship between lecturers and students. We, we don't know in our department, when we teach first years, we no longer know who they are, because we are now, our first year class is 500, uh, you see them four times a week, you don't remember their names, you vaguely remember their faces, um, and we have expanded um, uh, to the point where, um, it's, it's not feasible to consider this a university in the way WITS used to be. And I'll, I'll just use that example because then I can't be accused of speaking for anybody else. Right? So it's just WITS. I think it's common across other universities. We have these large classes. We have, don't have a support system. So you have 500 students, 10 faculty, one administrator who has to deal with uh, the, the, the multiple queries of a, thank you, of a, uh, a student body that is coming into the university as the first generation university students, right? They don't have the cultural capital that WITS students had in the 19, you know, the period before the 1980s. They don't, they don't know how to apply for various things. They don't know how to work the system. They don't understand the rules. They're slightly intimidated. Uh, if they're not intimidated, they're dismissive. So, you know, there's, a, there's an issue there. We leave all of that to academics to deal with. We don't, we haven't invested in, in that. So that, that, to me, is where we start talking about funding. Um, it's not about, we used to have academic support programs. Those are all dismantled because now it's sink or swim for the students. And they, they come in, you know, at Wits University, as I'm sure in other universities, uh, we have students who arrive on the first day of registration with their suitcase, with nowhere to stay, with uh, no idea of how they're going to pay for their education, um, and we have to advise them on a, a range of issues from where they can spend the night to what kind of courses they want to do and whether it will get them a job at the end of the day. Um, so we, we don't have an infrastructure for dealing with that. Um, I don't think... Many universities, 
Some small ones like roads are actually better placed to do this, but we don't have the infrastructure for those in entering students. We want to have a, an expansion of the, the postgraduate system. We're now uh, setting all over all our universities new targets for bringing in PhDs and uh, master's students, but we haven't expanded funding to uh, the staff so that we don't have enough teaching staff. We don't have enough people to mark and assess the grades of students. Um, we deal with that, I think, in most universities by cutting down on the number of uh, writing assignments. So we compound the problem. We have students who come in with very few skills, and we don't give them the opportunities to build those skills. Write, write, read, read. That's what it is in the humanities. That is how you become a good uh, uh, humanities graduate, is by extensive reading and extensive writing. And if you're not uh, being pushed to do that, because uh, in fact, you know, the, the lecturers think, well, if we, if we give you a piece of writing every uh, two weeks, who's going to grade it? Um, we can't do that. So, you know, move to essays. Well, essays become too hard to grade 500 essays in a uh, two f in our system. We grade two essays in a um, 14 or 13 week block. That means you are continually marking. Um, and if you want to give adequate feedback, uh, then if you're somebody who, who wants to the student to learn from your marking, not just get a mark, then the amount of work involved there is also uh, massive. So why then, so we're not reading for a degree anymore, um, and we're not, we're not able to give students the attention that they deserve, that they pay for, uh, that they sacrifice huge amounts uh, for. So, so why don't we do what seems to be, uh, to, to an ordinary academic, very sensible uh, uh, things in dealing with this crisis? Uh, why do we go for the magic bullet solutions? This is what I, I don't understand. It's all about the glitz. It's all about the huge, you know, putting huge amounts of money into uh, research chairs, I don't know if there's anybody here who has a research chair, but there's more time spent in administration and management of the money that goes with the research chair than there is actually, uh, in my view, spent on, on doing the work that's necessary. Um, here are my proposals, and they're very, very practical, and they come from, they come from below. Okay? I think we need a four-year degree in this country. The... the American system is based on a four-year degree. Uh, in that four-year degree, the curriculum can be structured. In fact, it's required in many universities that you have a teaching credit and you have a computer skills credit, right? I think we need to do that. We need to have uh, a system which recognizes that, it, that the lecturers can't do everything. They can't teach one-on-one -on -one writing skills. Um, to students, they can't, uh, they can't provide, the, the teaching of writing is in itself a skill. The ability to teach writing, you need to be trained to teach writing. I think we need to do that. Some American universities, and it's uh, regarded uh, in uh, the older South African universities as a laughable suggestion, but they do in fact have possible grades for things like community uh, service. I just put that on the table. I think when you have a four-year degree anyway, you have a lot of flexibility, a lot more flexibility than in our th third year, in our three-year system. I think the next part of the uh, of the solution must ha does have to do with funding postgraduate students. I think uh, instead of putting uh, huge amounts of money into catalytic projects, into committees meeting and panels discussion panel discussions about what is ne necessary, do what the North American system does, which is there is a fixed number of uh, bursaries, fully paid, three years, you, you apply on a competitive basis, you, uh, once, you are, once you do that, uh, once you get in on the competitive basis for, for the masters of the PhD, you move into a pool of teaching assistants, uh, those teaching assistants uh, then uh, become part of the system of teaching, so they, uh, they learn 
they learn how to teach in particular disciplines firstly, which I think is, a, is also an undervalued skill. Um, they uh, act as the tutorial system uh, for the students, for the undergraduate students. They act as an interface and a humanizing uh, factor in the entire uh, system uh, of teaching so that it may not, maybe the lecturers can't know every student, but there will be tutors who know every student and understand what their, their difficulties are and then that they also get trained in how to teach. Um, I think that, that linkage um, then uh, acts as a way of funding uh, undergraduates as well. So it's not, it's not just funding uh, postgraduates. Um, and and that, uh, that would take care of one very major uh, stumbling block that we have in postgraduate education and in research, which is that most people in this country cannot do their PhDs full time. They, they have to work. And so it becomes something that gets dragged out. Our throughput rates are shocking. Um, I um, chaired for the Ford Foundation uh, their international scholarships for the Southern African region. And we found that the students who took up the scholarship and went and studied abroad uh, finished their degrees much quicker than the students who took the scholarships up in South Africa. And it's because people have all these multiple demands uh, that, that are made. So if you had a proper bursary and it was competitive and, you knew, and each department knew that's the, this is the number of uh, bursaries it has, we can work out the, the model for that, um, I think we would go a long way. We obviously need to in, increase the number of staff. Uh, I think that, that goes without saying. We, we, in, the, in the ASAF report, you talk about a missing middle. The missing, the missing middle is because we, can't, we haven't been able to produce the PhDs that will then go on to do the research uh, and become the young academics of the future. We don't fund in this country adequately field work for PhD students. We don't fund language acquisition skills. In fact, you know, when, when I did my PhD in Canada, I had to have a second language. It was a requirement. Uh, and, you know, in my case, I, I made it an argument for Afrikaans, which is the only written second language I have. But it should be a requirement. It used to be a requirement that you have a, you have a second language in order to get a humanities degree. Um, I think you should have that second language if you're a doctor as well, actually. I think if you can only be a doctor in, in English, it's a problem in our country. So bring that back, and you'll see that African languages will start to grow again because it's now become a requirement. Um, English uh, language and literature, French, all of those will start to grow because it becomes a, a, a required um, um, course for a degree. Sorry, I'll just stop in a minute. But I just want to say that I, you know, I think if we do this, actually, and we do it across the universities, not just... Uh, in some, and that's where I would see legislation beginning to play a role in a positive way, not in a regulatory, uh, stifling way. I think this would take us to creating the research productivity uh, in a more organic and meaningful way than creating more prestigious chairs, uh, then creating a stratification of sort of s that you now have superstar professors who don't actually have to engage with students anymore you know, who get funded uh, to have these glamorous projects, whereas the rest of the uh, academic staff are picking up the pieces because there's no funding. So for me, the, the magic bullet solution is not one that is sustainable. It's not one that will build the university in the long term. Uh, and it's not, it, it's, it, I, I agree with many of the critiques about increasing bureaucratization. And heaven forbid we have enough of that. Uh, you know, this, uh, this, uh, I haven't even begun to talk about the kind of uh, work that is required to do research, to apply for a grant, to then manage that grant, to report on that grant. Um, you, you know, in the humanities, you want to say, why? You know, I want to go and sit in an archive. Why I want to read this body of literature. I need a bit of time to do that. I need a rejigging of the university calendar. American universities 
the academics, as we know, come out here because they come here at this time of the year, they have a full three months when they are not required to do any administrative work. They're not even required to be at their home universities. Um, that is when they write the books that we value. That is when they do uh, the conferencing that creates the networks that leads to, uh, uh, to the outputs that we are being required to produce. Um, I know that is the case because if any, and any one of you have had to work with uh, academics in the United States, you know how much more time they have per project than we do. It's very hard to say why we don't have that time unless you understand what this daily grind of being an academic uh, at a university in South Africa is about. So I want to, I want to make a, a plea for us to move away from the politics of uh, Charters and institutes and so on, and look at where, uh, look at the chalk face, look at the on the ground problems that we face in humanities. Thank you.